John chapter 15, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in these weeks looking at why we should win souls. I believe we know we should win souls. I believe we know we should be a witness for Jesus Christ. We know that just simply because the Holy Spirit tells us. Now, when we're out and about, the Holy Spirit will move on our hearts and He'll prick our hearts to speak up and give someone our testimony or give someone a gospel track. And again, I just want simply through these several weeks, I just want to help you wherever you are in this matter of soul winning. I want to encourage you to go to the next level. Uh, if you, again, as I said last week, if you have to start with uh, planting a track and running, start with that. I mean, I don't care. Start with something. Start with something. Uh, if you if you can't even, you can't barely look anybody in the eye, you just go like this at them. Start with something. I mean, start somewhere. Uh, uh, well, I don't know if I'm ready. I'm not in order. I don't know if I can tell somebody about Jesus. Can you take a gospel track? And can you go, hey, here, you take this, and I'll read one to you. Here, ready? And read it to them. Say, what's that going to accomplish? I'm going to tell you what it's going to accomplish. This is the Word of God. Right. And the power is not in us. It's in God's Word. Amen. It's in the Spirit of God. And so whatever you can do to find a way to get the gospel to someone else, do it. Uh, uh, like Kelsey was mentioned, at work, maybe she's not allowed to give out a gospel tract, but she can speak up and say, hey, let me ask you about Jesus. I heard, heard several testimonies this morning asking, are you saved? Praise the Lord. Oh, that's wonderful. I mean, you probably are the only person, probably the only person who's ever come up to that person in public and asked them that question. And so, again, I just want to encourage you, I want to challenge you to ask God to use you, and He will, I promise you, he will. Tonight we're going to look at uh, chapter uh, John chapter 15, much of the chapter. This is what's known as the fruit-bearing chapter. Now, folks would say, if you ask the question, what's the fruit of a Christian? Some might say, well, it's love, it's joy, it's peace, it's long-suffering, it's gentleness, it's goodness, it's faith, it's meekness, it's temperance. Actually, those are the fruit of the Spirit. Now, notice it doesn't say fruits. It says fruit because all those things come together. When you're filled with the Spirit of God, what is the Spirit? Uh, how does He operate in your life? He operates with love, with joy, with peace, with long-suffering, with gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. And the fruit of the Spirit helps you to bear the fruit of a Christian. Now, what's the fruit of a Christian? Well, let's stop and think about this for a minute. What's the fruit of... And we're going to go ahead and we'll make this interactive here for a minute, okay? What's the fruit of an apple tree? Go ahead and tell me. What is apple, it? Apple. Apples. That's right. Apples and apple trees. That's the fruit of an apple tree. Uh, what's the fruit of a blueberry bush? Blueberry. Blueberry. Blueberries. I know this is really getting hardcore stuff tonight. What's the fruit of a potato tree? No, just kidding. I want to see you really. What's the fruit of a potato, a potato tree? <laughs> no. Uh, but everything bears after its kind, right? What then would the fruit of a Christian be Christian. other Christians. If you're healthy, God wants you to be bearing fruit. If you're healthy, you will bear fruit. If you're healthy as a Christian, you'll be reproducing yourself. You'll be reaching out to other people. And what I want to encourage you to do tonight is say, Lord, help me to bear some spiritual fruit. Lord, help me to reproduce myself spiritually. Lord, help me to get some other people into the kingdom of God. Lord, help me to push back the gates of hell and see someone saved because I gave them a gospel track or because I gave them my testimony. I want you to understand from John 15 that soul winning is not just an obligation, and it is. It's an obligation. It's a command. But it truly is the greatest joy you can find as a Christian. If you, uh, if you haven't experienced the joy of leading somebody else to Jesus Christ, you're missing out. Amen. You're missing out. And God wants you to experience that joy. In fact, we're going to see here in John 15 that Jesus wrote these things to us about bearing fruit so that His joy might remain in us and that our joy might be full. I mean, there's no, uh, there's no greater joy than to hear that your children walk in truth. There's no greater joy than to look out on a Sunday morning and see somebody that you impacted for Jesus Christ. Now listen, all the glory goes to Jesus Christ, but we sure get a lot of joy in the work. And we get rewards for the work. Look at John 15, verse 1, please. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. 
And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Lord, speak to our hearts tonight about being fruit-bearing Christians. Help us to understand your scripture tonight. And help us, Lord, to be committed just to offer ourselves, to make ourselves available to you, I pray. We love you, Lord. Bless us to our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. What, is it, what do you need to be a fruit-bearing Christian? Number one, it's important to be clean to be a fruit-bearing Christian. It's important to be clean. Notice the analogy Jesus gives here again. Verse 1, He said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, He taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, He purgeth it. Now get the picture. Here's a vine. And connected to the vine, there are branches. Now who are the branches? Well, look down in verse 5. He said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. You know, here's an amazing thing about that. God, not only do we need God in order to bear fruit, but God needs you to bear fruit. A vine doesn't bear fruit without the branches. Listen, Jesus said this. He said, I'm going to my Father. He said, the works that I have done shall ye do, and greater than these shall ye do. He was talking to his disciples. He said, you are going to do greater works. The Bible says that God has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. He didn't give it to the angels. He did it himself while it was here. But when he left this place, he said, now I'm giving that ministry to you. He's the vine. We're the branches. If we're going to bear fruit, uh, we have to be connected to the vine. And the vine needs and wants the branches to bear fruit. Look at verse 3. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Number one, we need to be clean to be fruit-bearing Christians. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, soul winning is a spiritual work. And so what you need to do when you're getting ready to speak to somebody about Christ and just day to day, you need to keep short accounts with God. I mean, the moment God shows you a wrong attitude or a wrong word or a wrong thought or a wrong deed in your own heart, you know what you should do? You should make it right then, right then and there. Keep short accounts with God. We need to be clean to be fruit-bearing Christians. Uh, I remember at my parents' house in Michigan. Again, we grew up, I grew up out in the country, surrounded by farm fields. Behind our chicken coop, there were wild raspberry bushes. How I many you know what wild raspberries are? They're not blackberries. They're wild raspberries. They're different. They're good. They taste really good. And my neighbors and I, we found some broken pottery. We thought it was ancient pottery. You know, we thought we were archaeologists. And we saw a broken pottery. We saw some old Hires root beer cans, the kind with the tabs. So we thought, man, you know, little triangle teardrop tabs. Like, man, that's some old stuff. I bet we'll make millions of dollars here. And it was all in the middle of the wild raspberry patch. So I went and got my weed whacker. How many of you know a weed whacker is different than a trimmer? Yeah. You know what a weed whacker is? Some of you city folks know what he's talking about. A weed whacker looks kind of like a golf club. And you go out there and you know what you do with it? You whack weeds. You swing and you whack weeds. And we took that weed whacker and we went out there to the wild raspberry patch and we whacked down the whole wild raspberry patch. And you know what we did? We got us a whole bunch of broken shards of junk. And a bunch of old pans that were worth nothing. And... Uh, and got a little bit of cross-examination, too. You know, that kind of thing. But guess what? The very next year, I went out there to the wild raspberry patch. Would you believe it? The wild raspberry patch was bigger. It was better. There was more fruit. The fruit was bigger. I mean, it, it multiplied the, the wild raspberry patch. Why? What had we done? We didn't even realize it, but what we were actually doing was we were pruning the wild raspberry patch. We were cutting out dead weight. We didn't even realize. Uh, so for some folks here, you're a gardener. I don't have a green thumb at all. I kill stuff accidentally. And, uh, but for some of you, you're, you're pruning roses or you trim different bushes. Why? You're trying to cut off dead weight. You know what God wants to do in your life? He wants to clean you. He wants to cut out dead weight. He wants to cut out things that are hindering your witness. Now, they might not even be sin. They might just be things that hinder you from being the soul winner God wants you to be. But look at verse 3. He said, now ye are clean through what? What does he clean us with? Through the word which I have spoken unto you. You know what these are? These are pruning shears. Amen. God will take his word and he'll clean you. He'll cut parts out of your life. He'll, he'll, he'll do things in 
in your life to make you more productive as a Christian. Amen. We need to be clean to be fruit-bearing Christians. Number two, we need to abide in Christ to be fruit-bearing Christians. Look at verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Number two, we must abide in Christ to be fruit-bearing Christians. What does it mean to abide? You know, I visit places from time to time. Uh, I, I'll go home and I'll visit my parents in Michigan. We'll, we'll visit family and friends sometimes out in Nebraska or Missouri or Alabama. But we don't live there. We don't hang our hats there. That's not where we spend most of our time. We don't abide there. We're just sojourning. We're just visiting. Listen, what Jesus said is, if you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. What does it mean to abide? It means to live there. I abide. I, did you know we walk to church every day? We walk to church. I abide at 850 Fisher Lane. I walk to church. I'm committed. 850 Fisher Lane. I abide there. I hang my hat there. It's where I go home to. I live there. You know what Jesus said? He said, if you'll abide in me. You know what it means to abide in him? It means to live there. You know, have you ever had somebody say, man, that person, they eat, drink, sleep, football. They eat, drink, sleep, basketball, the stock market, you name it. Something that draws your attention. Something that you think about all the time. I mean, you live there. Your mind lives there. You know what? To be a fruit-bearing Christian, we need to learn to abide in Jesus Christ. That means think about it. I mean, dwell upon Him. Think about the price He paid. Love Him. Spend time with Him in His Word. Spend time in prayer with Him. Spend time telling other people about Him. And Jesus said, if you'll abide in Me, and He said, then you will be able to bear much fruit. Notice 2 Corinthians 3, verse 5. In fact, I'll just quote it. The Bible says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything is of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Here's what I want to encourage you with when it comes to soul winning. To be an effective soul winner doesn't require talent. It doesn't require great ability. You know what it requires? It requires God operating through you. That's all it requires. It requires you making yourself available to God, and God will use you. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, please. Turn there for a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at verse number 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 3. The Bible says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. If we don't tell other people about salvation, that's not going to harm those who are already saved. Who is it going to harm? Those who are lost. Those who are headed for a devil's hell. In whom, notice verse 4, the God of this world, who is that? That's Satan hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves. Aren't you glad of that? Aren't you glad when you're going out so and you're not saying, let me tell you about Tim DeVries. Let me tell you about John Sanders. Let me tell you about Bradley Goodman or James Buster. You're not, telling, you're not preaching yourself. I don't have anything to offer a lost and dying world but Jesus. That's all I have to offer. When they, they looked at Peter and it, the, the, the man expected to receive some money from them, he said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Amen. You know what he had to offer? He had Jesus to offer. Amen. Listen, you don't have to have any particular skill or ability or background or knowledge or finances to be a soul winner. You just have to be able to offer Jesus. That's it. Amen. Notice what he says, verse Five, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Amen. Folks, you don't have to be 
anything important to this world to be a soul winner. You know, all you have to do is be willing to offer yourself to God. We must abide in Christ. We need to be clean to be fruit-bearing Christians. We need to abide in Christ. Number three, look back at John 15, please. We need to have His Word abiding in us. We need to have His Word abiding in us. Listen, folks, the power is not in us. It's in the Word of God. The track that you hand somebody is so powerful. How is it powerful? Because it's the Word of God. John 15, 7 Notice what Jesus said. He, and this is a great prayer promise, but it applies to fruit bearing. The context is fruit bearing. Look at verse 7. If ye abide in me, and my, what's the next word? And my words abide in you. Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. We need to have God's word abiding in us to be fruit bearing Christians. Listen, we don't go out and tell people stories and give them psychology to get them saved. You know what we give them? We give them the word of God. Say, Pastor, what do I do if I go to somebody's house and I go to give them a track or I pull out my Bible to show them how to be saved? And they go, well, I don't even believe that's God's Word. I think man wrote that book. What do you do? Well, if you were on the battlefield and you had a, a, a weapon in your hands and someone came up to you and said, I don't think that's a real weapon, what would you do? Would you open the case and show them the manual and take the gun apart and Show them videos about the gun and say, see, it really is a real gun. No, you'd go, one, two, bang. You'd use it. And they'd go, oh, that's a real weapon. What if somebody says, I think man wrote the book. Okay, well, let me share it with you anyway. So, Pastor, why don't they have to believe that's God's word to get saved? No, the Holy Spirit will do his work as you just share the word. See, the Holy Spirit of God rides in the chariot of God's Word. Ephesians 6, 17 says, The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. John 6, 63 says, The flesh profiteth nothing. The Spirit, the words that I speak in you, they are Spirit and they are life. You know what you do when you go to somebody? They say, I don't believe that's God's Word. Say, okay, can I read it to you anyway? Make your decision then. Just pull it out and use it. Why? Because there's power in the Word of God. Through the Word of God, the Holy Spirit convicts lost people of their need to be saved. Hebrews 4.12 says the Word of God is quick. That means it's alive. And powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There's power in the Word of God. There's power in His Word. Listen, the power is not in us. The power is in God. The power is in his, in his book. The power is in His Spirit. Through the Word of God, the Holy Spirit convicts the lost. I've told you this story before. Sometimes you don't feel very powerful when you give the Gospel. Sometimes you, you feel like, man, I should have felt something more. I should have, I should have been more bold or I should have been stronger. I, I mentioned Ed Kimball who led D.L. Moody to Christ. and he said, it at, he said, I gave a very weak plea for Jesus Christ, but D.L. Moody got saved. I've told you the story before about Robin, the, the lady at Unique Thrift. How I was there at Unique Thrift, and I, my habit was to give out gospel tracts, and I gave out the gospel tract. And Robin, the manager, came up and said, we don't do that here. Well, another time I was in the store, and I gave out another gospel tract. She came up to me, mad, face mad. I said, we don't do that here. The third time I'm checking out, she came and said, next time you do that, I'm going to call the police on you. I wish I could tell you I went, bless God, I'm going to do it no matter what happens. But you know what I did? I said, I'm not going to keep going back there. A few years passed. I was coming home from work in southern Indiana. I was in Meyer, tired, dirty, picking up some things for work, from uh, for, for home, headed home from work. I was in the back of Meyer on the main grocery aisle. I was walking up the aisle. Guess who I saw walking towards me, pushing the car? It was Rob. And as I've said before, we, don't act like you know we've all done this. Or you go, I don't really want to talk to anybody right now. You ever been that way? You know you're supposed to be a soul winner, but you just don't want to talk to anybody right now. You know you should represent Jesus, but not right now. I'm tired. I'm grumpy. I'm hungry. I'm walking down that aisle. I saw her, and I tried. <laughs> I tried to dart into the aisle. She saw me, and she caught my eye. I thought, oh, no. <laughs> Don't act like you've never done that before. <laughs> I know better. 
you know, you go to visit the bus kids home. Mom and dad said to tell you they're not home. Okay. <laughs> tell them when they are home, I want to talk to them. We're not home. Okay. Yeah, you, you've all you've heard that before. <laughs> well, I was there, I tried to dart in the aisle. Here she came. And she said, are you that one that used to give out, she didn't call them tracts, she called them something like pamphlets or papers about Jesus? I'm thinking, well, how do I answer this? You know, she just said she's going to call the cops next time she sees me. I said, yeah, that's me. She said, I just want to thank you. Because I got saved a couple years later. And now I go and tell other people about Jesus. Was I a powerful Christian? I wasn't going, bless God, hear what the Bible says. You know what I was doing? I was just going, I really should give them a track. Here. It's easy to handle a track because there's a dollar bill. Here. You don't do that here. Guess who was still knocking on her heart's door after I left? The Holy Spirit. Power wasn't me. It's nothing I said. Power's in His Word. The power's in the Spirit of God who is in you. That's where the power is. The Holy Spirit works through God's Word. And I'm simply trying to encourage you to say, if you'll just make yourself available to God to give the Word of God up, to give out gospel tracts, to let God work through you, He will. He will. He will. Look at the end of John 15. There's some really great blessings that come as a result of soul winning. Look at John 15, verse 8. The Bible says, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. He said, you really want to bring glory to your heavenly Father? You really want to be a disciple of mine? Who's a disciple? What's a disciple? It's someone who disciplined themselves to follow their leader. He said, you want to be my disciple? You want to be my follower? You want to bring glory to the Father? Then bear much fruit. What's the fruit of a Christian? Another Christian. How does that bring glory to God? It brings glory because nobody else can save the soul. I can't save the soul. You can't save the soul. Only Jesus can. But as we lead others to Him, He gets all the glory. But we get blessed and we get rewarded. Next, I want you to see soul when He gives favor with God. Here, here's kind of a trick question. Does God have favorites? Well, the answer is yes, He does. There are some that He'll show more favor to. You know who He shows favor to? Those who are doing His will. But here's the key. Guess what? We can all be favorites. We can all get favor with God by doing what He's asked us to do. All of us. doesn't matter who you are. You can find a way to get the gospel to somebody else. You can give a track like that. You can drop a track in a bill and another bill and another bill. You can, you can find a way to get the gospel out. Soul winning gives favor with God. Look at verse 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Look at verse 11. What else does soul winning do? Fruit bearing. It gives you fullness of joy. Verse 11, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. There's no greater joy than getting others to Jesus Christ. What else does soul winning do? It helps us to love others the way we should. You know, when, when we say things like, well, I don't want to offend them, so I'm not going to say anything. What we really mean is we don't want them to offend us. What we really mean is I don't want them to think poorly about me. The truth is, this person's lost and headed for hell. How am I offending them? No, I'm trying to save them. Right. If somebody was in a house and the house was burning down, what would I do? I'd go to the door and say, hey, get out of the house! Everybody away now. <laughs> get out of the house! It's burning down! You wouldn't go, man, I don't want to offend them. Right. I don't want to yell too loud. They might think poorly of me. No, you're going to do what you can. Why? Because of concern for them. You know what soul winning does? It makes you leave behind your pride and, and, and no longer are you concerned about what they think about you. You're more concerned about where they headed for all eternity. 
Greater love, verse 13, hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Soul winning gives us a special closeness with the Lord. Look at verse 15. Why? Because that's what's closest to the heart of God. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Would you ask God to help you be a fruit-bearing Christian? Would you yield yourself to Him? Would you let Him clean you with His Word? Would you abide in Jesus Christ? Would you think about Him often? I mean, would you just live there? And would you let His Word abide in you? And would you just let His Word flow through you to impact somebody else? God will use you. God will use you. Just make yourself available. Let's Hi, everybody. Here. This is Tim DeVries, pastor of Vision Valley Baptist Church in Mount Washington, Kentucky. And I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel today. Our desire is that the world know Jesus Christ as Savior and that in this generation, His people will be faithful, uh, courageous, bold witnesses for Him. I want to say to you, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God loves you and wants you to know for sure that you have a home in heaven. In order to know for sure you're saved and that you're going to heaven, the Bible tells us we need to know, first of all, that we're all sinners. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because of our sin, we don't measure up to God's glory. God is perfect, we are not. And sin keeps us out of heaven. Secondly, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. The scripture says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Revelation 20, 14 and 15 says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. And because of our sin, we don't deserve heaven. Unfortunately, we deserve a devil's hell. But the good news is this, that God loves us. And because he loves us, he made one way of salvation. It's not through a church. It's not through a religion. It's not through doing the best works you can do. The only way He made to get to heaven is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Me. And in Acts 4.12, the Scripture says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus came to this earth. He was born. He lived a perfect, sinless life. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus took our place on the old rugged cross. He was crucified, buried, and rose again to pay for our sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus today offers you a free gift. That gift is eternal life heaven instead of hell. And if today you're willing to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you're willing to call on Him today to save you, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10.13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you call on the Lord Jesus Christ right now to be your Savior? If you will, He promised He would save you. Feel free to contact us with any questions. We want to help you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ. God bless you.